But you know, I'll shock you with this. I don't pray for everybody that asks me to pray for their healing. Does God heal everyone? A husband and businessman shares what he's learned. Plus, Russia continues to be a concern for America. Why did this father and teacher risk his life to take Bibles there? That and more coming up next. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. The Bible speaks in many places about the importance of faith and or believing. My next guest has a viewpoint. There's a direct connection to a person's ability to be healed and between their, that and their faith. And Terry Dismore is a businessman. He's been involved in radio. And a lot of this revelation in your own life started on your honeymoon. Yeah. Now, this is a family show, but tell me how that, <laughs> tell me how that happened. I'll do my best. Yeah. Well, I got married in 1985, mm -hmm. uh, July of 1985. So we're coming up on 33 years. And we got married on Saturday. On Tuesday morning, I woke up and my wife was laying there wide awake looking at me. And I thought, well... You know, we're newlyweds. Yeah. She wants to have a good look at this face, yeah, you know. And I said, what's wrong? She said, I've been awake all night. I'm very sick. So called the doctor and he said, give her this pill and this pill and come home. And don't go to the, ho the house, go to the hospital. The next day, she woke up. She said, where am, where am I? And I said, you're in the hospital in New Albany. Did you know yet what was wrong? No, had no idea. They did some tests. And uh, the doctor said, well, something's wrong with her kidneys. Okay, I mean, I just, just got this brand new bride, and yeah. I'm, I'm hoping the warranty's still <laughs> good, you know. And so, I mean, we joke about it all the time now because it was such a traumatic thing yeah, for yeah. a newlywed couple to go through. Sure. We signed wills on the fourth day of marriage, and they said she might not make it. Uh, oh. She had a, what's called a necrotic kidney, which means it was dead. It was dying. Or it yeah, was already it, dead. it was gone. It was still there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we're not sure if we can save the other one. Okay, so she had surgery, had that kidney removed. The other one worked fine. As a matter of fact, most people don't know this, but there are a lot of people out there that have one kidney. Mm -hmm. They just don't know it. And she's functioned fine on, it, uh, fine on it now for 33 years. But in that, we began to pray for healing. We were going to uh, an Assembly of God church at the time, and we believed in, in uh, healing and mm -hmm. how people should be. And... Um, uh, but she didn't get well. And we wound up moving to Columbus for me to run a radio station up here. And um, in that time, she got sicker and sicker. Uh, had 13 or 14 major surgeries. I was told probably 11 times in that period of time that we were married that she wasn't going to make it through the night this or through the week. This is all tied to the kidney? All tied to the illness that she had, which was called anti-cardiolipin antibody syndrome. Well... Sounds like something wrong with your heart, but it's not. It has something to do. It's a it's a disease similar to lupus in that your body attacks itself. Mm -hmm. So it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, we uh, continued to pray and believe for healing. Did you sit down at that time with her and say, "This is our battle plan. This is how we're going to fight this thing. We've got doctors; they're doing their best, but this is this is our battle plan." No. Uh, just to be honest, just, no, we didn't just, know just, what to do. Just, but you naturally knew to pray. Well, we didn't know to pray. I mean, she'd mm -hmm. been saved. We'd both been saved about the same time when we were 13 years old. Had you ever seen healing before? From, I mean, as the result of prayer? No. Where somebody specifically prayed for somebody to be healed. And you, so you were, you were going on pretty thin faith. Well, I was. I was going on, I mean, I've heard testimonies, but mm -hmm. you ask, have I seen it? Yeah. And I hadn't seen it before. I had heard of it, but I hadn't seen it. So we got married in 85. We've gone this long. And this is in 2001 that she's been, been sick. She's been sick that whole time. Uh, yes, and she would be sick for a while and well for a while, but it was never, but you oh, never man, felt I feel like great. You never over the hump. You never no. felt like that. We went, uh, went home eventually, and one day in prayer, I heard the Lord say to me, either I can fix her or you can keep trying. Why would God say that to I didn't think it was a works thing, and I didn't think it was based on what I did, but I did think, and I do think now, we can get in the way of what God wants to do, mm -hmm. what He's already said that He's going to do. I think we can get did in the you, way. Did you get a vision of that, how you, how you might be standing in the way? Mm -hmm. for yeah, I understood it. I understood fairly quickly mm -hmm. what He meant. Because I was praying a day or so later, I'm like, okay, what do I do? What am I doing mm -hmm. to stand in your way? And He said, tonight, when your wife gets sick, don't take her to the hospital. She'll beg you to take her to the hospital. Don't do it. 
as long as night of my life. So the next morning, about 5.30, I heard her on the phone in the other room. You know, they used to have phones attached to the wall. And, oh, it's yeah, crazy. Right. New technology. And, yeah, I tell you. And she's calling her doctor. And I hear her say, well, my husband doesn't want to bring me, but I want to come. And so I'm like, okay, Lord, what do I do? And he goes, well, now, this is her. This isn't you. Oh, okay. But I want you to tell her three things. We're going to go to the hospital. They're not going to treat you well. They're going to not find anything wrong with you. They're going to give you a shot and send you home. So that afternoon, we went, got out of the emergency room where they had not found anything wrong with her, told her they couldn't find anything, they didn't treat her well, they gave her a shot, and we went home. And I reminded her of that. And she said, I don't know. And that began a period of about three or four nights where we had some of the deepest spiritual conversations that we had had in our entire marriage. Between the two of you. Between just me and her sitting at dinner. So on Friday, she didn't feel much better, but there was a peace about her. On Saturday morning, she woke me up. And she said, uh, I'm going to throw all my medicines out. And she was on 13 different medicines at the time. Now, I know a lot of people watching this are probably on 10 or 12. And I've mm -hmm. had doctors say, you know, you get on more than two or three and you've got side effects working against side That's effects. That's right. They're, they're, every medication is going to have a side effect or something True. else eventually. And so she, um, we went, I said, can I help you? And she said, all you can do is help me carry him to the bathroom. And we poured $150 worth, that's the deductible amount, <laughs> down the toilet. I was, I, I have to say there was some fear involved. Now, here's mm -hmm. what I want to say to you. In all this, my faith is not like, oh, yeah. It's not like that. It is, God, I trust you. And I believe you're speaking to me, and I believe you're speaking to her. And I believe what your word says, that by your stripes we have been healed. It's a past tense, mm -hmm. not a future or even current tense. So, okay, that was on Saturday. Sunday, I, went, she, I said, how do you feel? She said, I don't feel any better, but I know I'm healed. So she's, okay. she's proclaiming it. That, yeah, that by this time it's... Coming out this way. Had she way. ever spoken that before? We had, but it was in hope, not in belief. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between the two. So, uh, Monday morning, I'm at my desk, and I call my wife, see how she was every morning. And the nurse was coming that day to bring her her walker, and it wasn't good. How old was she at the time? Uh, let's see, it was 2001, so she was 41. I was 40. Wow. And, uh, Young for... Yeah. To be in that devastating oh, yeah. condition. Yeah. And we see people we see people today that are like that, that are just like, okay, I'm gonna accept this. I'm gonna take this. This is my disease. This is what belongs to me, my cancer, my heart attack, my heart problems. And it's like quit claiming them. Quit saying to the taking possession. Yeah. yeah, it's like, oh, these are mine. Well, what are you gonna do with them? Now if it's your Corvette, okay, I'm all right <laughs> with that. But if it's your you know. Um, so I said uh, I call the house and she's out of breath, which was like, oh no, what happened? Mm -hmm. And she's like that. And I said, oh, what's the matter, honey? She said, Terry, I'm healed. And I'm like, oh, I know that you're going to be. And she said, no, no, I'm healed. And I said, baby, I'm believing with you that you're going to be healed. And she said, listen to me. I've been running up and down the steps for the last 20 minutes. Wow. And I said, well, what happened? And she said, I, I felt the Lord say, get to the couch. Now, we lived in a house that had the master on the first floor. Mm -hmm. So she crawled out to the couch. She could not walk to the couch. She crawled out there, and she started praying. And she praised and worshiped God because she knew by his word she had been healed. She knew that it was coming. We didn't know when, but she said, I felt like a deluge hit me on the top of my head. And when it came out the bottom of my feet, I was on them. And she said, I was clean of that disease, and I know I am, and I know I was, running around the house. And she's still healed today. Yeah. I mean, she was, and she is, and she, she is. Now, is. I will tell you this, that we've had illnesses that other people have, mm -hmm. but she's not sick. She, as a matter of fact, had two stents put in four years ago. Mm -hmm. And people are like, well, didn't you believe for healing for her heart? People are smart, Alex Bob. Yeah, they, I'm going to tell can you. Be. What would you tell somebody right now that's, that's in the middle of that same battle you may have been in? One praying for your wife, and two, how she can pray, how, how, they, how you can reach out and grab a hold in, in, in that case. I'll shock you with this. I don't pray for everybody that asks me to pray for their healing. And I'm going to tell you why. Mm -hmm. 
If you note in the Bible, in the New Testament, when Jesus is going around healing people, there are a few times that he can't. Because of their unbelief? Because of their unbelief. And almost every time he does heal somebody, he says something to the effect, your faith has made you well. So we look at, well, Jesus can do anything. He couldn't, he couldn't always. And Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. He's fully God and fully man. And yet the truth is we get in his way. We get in his way. So here's what I tell people when they start talking about wanting to get healed is, first of all, what do you believe about healing? Mm -hmm. And if they say to me, well, I believe God can, I say, well, there's your problem. It's a fact. It's a fact in your, life, your wife's life. Yeah. And it's a fact that you guys can, can, can say, this, is, this has happened to us. God, God had healed her. Yeah. And, and I, believe he, I believe he wants to work that in everyone's life. But I believe we stop him from time to time. Russia continues to be a concern for America. Why did this father and teacher risk his life to take Bibles there? We were, our faces were actually on the TV and it was saying these people don't associate with them, don't deal with them because these people are basically in a cult. Russia has been a location for decades that Americans distrusted and assumed is blocked to the American church. Well, for a time after the Soviet collapse, the church flourished in Russia. But recent events have changed that narrative. Bill Sammons is a former varsity football coach, the leader of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes at, a high, at his high school, a husband, a father, yet he still made it a personal mission to get Bibles to Christians in Russia. So that first trip was when? Back in 2013 was the first trip. So back then you could still take Bibles. A lot of people think it's, you're going to, if you take Bibles into Russia, you're going to get shot. But you guys decided to take Bibles into Russia, and you were fairly open to do that. Yeah, back in actually 1992, 1993, they actually went out to the Red Square, and they gave out approximately 200,000 Bibles in 66 minutes. And uh, it was just a public ordeal. They just gave out Bibles left and right. This is Tommy Williams. And then I got a hold of him and back in 2013. You can still give out Bibles in the streets. And so I was giving out what's called padariks and they're called gifts in, in Russia. And we were giving out Bibles and we were giving out little tracts, you know, for them to read and to be saved. We can talk openly about this. Um, no longer can you do that. What, what, what caused the change? Um, I think the change occurred because the, 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 the government sees the miracles that's happening in the church and it scares them. They don't yeah. understand that Jesus is powerful and Jesus will cause miracles to happen. They call it witchcraft. They call it mm -hmm. black magic. And so when we went there, we were, our faces were actually on the TV and it was saying these people don't associate with them, don't deal with them because these people are basically in a cult. And uh, they, they try to formulate the Christian church as being in a cult because of all these miracles that are happening. And so I went into a Russian Orthodox church one time and looked at it and it was beautiful and everything. And I looked at the lady and she said, what are you? And I said, I'm Baptist. She turned around, she said, leave, leave, leave. And she said, get away, you know. Wow. Yeah, I know people that are involved with Foro, Friends of Russian Orphanages. Yes. And they were going there at times and adopting Russian children that were in, in serious need, but now no long, they, they can no longer adopt children in Russia. Yeah, no longer can you adopt a child from Russia. It's kind of the ties are really being cut off and it's scary. And this is the main reason why we need to penetrate the Russian culture with as much Christianity as we possibly can. How do we still do that if the restrictions, I mean, the restrictions are based on the, their, their, their excuse was terrorism, to stop terrorism. But how do we still do that without, without violating the law? That's a great question. Um, and I think the main reason we need to do is, is basically get in touch with people who can get over there to get God's word with people who needs and wants mm -hmm. God's word. And uh, I think Tommy Williams, he's in charge of I Am For The Urals, and uh, you can give to his organization, and he is probably the number one giver of Bibles in Russia right now. This one individual is the number one giver of Bibles in Russia right now. It, and it costs $3 to give a Bible out to, to people in Russia. Mm -hmm. So our church has been giving money to this organization, and I encourage everybody else to uh, also, because not only does it encourage them to give money out for the Bibles, but also we visit orphanages, we visit drug rehab centers, which are huge in Russia, and we can give Bibles out to these people. Drug rehab centers, uh, you've, you've talked about, we, we've seen miracles 
oh, in, in drug addicts. There's a huge problem. In, I mean, we think we got a problem here, <laughs> but a huge problem in Russia with drug addiction right now. And, they're, and we are seeing miracles through the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we're seeing a ton of miracles over there. It, it, my first time I went there, uh, we do what's called a banya. Uh, a banya is a basically it's a, a very very hot building a sauna is mm -hmm. what it is and they they love these banyas long story short it was a christian organization who was giving me this banya so they give me a massage and give me a banya and just and all of a sudden i go so were you a drug addict yes i was a drug addict i actually killed somebody about two years ago oh were you a drug addict were you a drug addict uh, everyone i was dealing with in this banya were drug addicts and i was like okay i'm in the middle of this <laughs> <laughs> russia drug addicts. Yeah, we're, 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 they were drug yeah. addicts at one time and now they're not and now they are the most loving giving people you've ever known in your life and it just floored me. It, 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 I could not believe the change that Jesus actually occurred in Russia. You know what I mean? I mean Jesus is alive and well in Russia and he's healing people left and right and Russian government are scared to death of this because they don't understand it. And your enthusiasm has caused uh, some other people to get committed. I mean, your, your, your daughter's been to Russia, right? Yes, I came back and they've heard the stories and they've seen the videos mm -hmm. of people getting baptized and people getting healed. And, and oh my goodness, See, my, my daughter, who her name's Sierra, and she's my youngest daughter, and she just is all in for the Lord. And she says, Dad, I want to go. My first answer was, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, you're not going to go. And so she said, Dad, I'm going like if you father. like it or not. And so I said, well, the only reason where you're going to go is if you go with your mom. So her, my my, my youngest daughter and my wife went in 2016 mm -hmm. and uh, God just changed their lives too as going because they see a whole different world. And it's happening in Russia. We, we hear that it's happening in China. It's happening in a lot of the areas of the third world. You think it could happen here? <laughs> Uh, I, I, you mean a closing in of, of the government controlling? That plus from that the explosion of, of what Christ is doing through the power of his Holy Spirit. Yeah, I think it, it, I can see both aspects actually occurring in America too where it's a closing, it's closing in where you know you can't do as much as what you used to mm -hmm. thought you can do and so on and so forth. But also I see the explosion of you know Jesus actually working through people in a miracle, mm -hmm. amazing ways. But it's incredible in how much he's working in Russia because nobody's going to stop my Lord from doing what he yeah. wants to do. Well, it sounds like you're all in. There's people <laughs> out there that say, I want that enthusiasm. I want to see that happen. I want to see God move in the, in the power of his spirit. What would you say to them right now? They're sitting on the pew. They're doing their job every day. They may be involved in uh, Fellowship Christian Athletes. How do they take that step further and get all in? Yeah, some people think that, you know, I don't want to go to Russia. I don't want to go to China. Yeah. I don't want to go to wherever. But I do hear God calling me to do this. They got to get out of the pew. They got to get off the bench and they got to get in the game. They got to say yes. They got to say, Lord, you told me to do this. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to do it. I don't care if it's writing a note to your friend, encouraging them to do certain things or even to, you know, go to support your local um, food store, or food bank, whatever. Do what God tells you to do because you'll never, never regret it because I am a lonely coach teacher and okay i'm in charge of the fellowship of christian athletes and then god calls me to do this if i would have said no to this there's a lot of avenues that couldn't have happened in russia that actually happened because jesus couldn't have worked through me to help build a church now in russia to help drug or drug rehab centers and to help orphanages and to help other churches and encourage them to help out your enthusiasm is infectious <laughs> oh uh, <laughs> well it, when, when jesus tells you to do something and you know it's right and you know uh, you said yes. It's just exciting to be involved in something that the Lord is uh, telling me to do. Guns and gun control. What does the Bible say? Uh, the biblical use of what the Bible would call a sword is permittable in a defensive situation. That and more when Viewpoint returns. Gun control in the Second Amendment is a major topic in today's news, and should it also be a topic from the pulpit of our churches? Well, today's guest is a pastor, is Walt Shepard, and he says, yes, it should be. He also holds a Bible study in a local gun shop in Ohio, which is 
probably one of the more unusual Bible studies going on in this part of Ohio right now. I, I would say it's quite rare, that's how long, for sure. How long have you been there? About five years. Five uh, we years. started with four guys, and uh, it just kind of grew through the years, and we, we run about 60, 65 guys come out, and yeah. it, uh, it's a great, great group of guys to come out. It's a how blessing. Did, how did you happen to start a Bible study in a gun shop? Well, the owner of the gun store uh, approached me. Uh, he's, a, he's a believer, and he wanted to uh, do something with his gun store to uh, glorify God, mm -hmm. and uh, so we just kind of uh, started talking and found out that uh, we agreed on a lot of issues. Aren't there a lot, not just people, but a lot of Christians that go, whoa, you can't be teaching, it's a gun shop. You can't be. That's uh, amazing. You there, can't be mixing gods and God and guns. It is amazing. It's a, there's a uh, a pacifist attitude that mm -hmm. uh, Christians shouldn't talk about guns and and uh, but when you look at the scripture and uh, and look at the not only Old and New Testament but put it all together, uh, there is a mandate, a biblical right. I mean, we have a Second Amendment right as a, as an American citizen, but we do have as Christians a biblical right uh, to keep and bear arms. But, uh, but do I, I mean, as a Christian, do I have a right to self-defense? Do I have a right to, to defend my family, or is it a responsibility? Well, well, the, well, the Lord Jesus Christ said, and he says in Luke 11, and, he, and I'll quote it, verse 21, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. And so when someone's armed uh, in a defensive position, uh, the goods are in peace. Mm -hmm. uh, his family's in peace. His children are in peace. His, uh, his uh, resources are in peace. But the very next verse says, But when he's stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor. And then it says and he, that he trusted and divideth his spoils. And so here's one that uses the, um, the, uh, the carrying of a sword for offensive. And he's taking peace. Mm -hmm. One that's uh, keeping peace is uh, defensive uh, to, uh, to keep his goods and his palace, if you would, in peace. So one is designed to keep, one is designed to take. So Jesus is very clear and, uh, that it's okay to defend your home against someone that would want to take from you peace. Uh, I would say this, our country and how it was founded and how it was preserved and what it was given to us uh, with uh, was, was built largely by a, a people that feared, this, feared God and loved this book. Uh, and, and I remember uh, as a little boy, I would watch John Wayne movies. I would, uh, uh, I, I, I would stay up in those days, back in the 70s, uh, they had, I, we had a little black and white TV, <laughs> and I just I couldn't wait to join the military. I was, I was, I was so, even as a little boy, I, said, I can't wait to get in the military, can't wait to get in the military. And, uh, and I, I, I proudly served my country as an infantryman. Uh, but uh, but uh, our, our country has drifted far uh, from what our founding fathers were. And, uh, and I know this, that if we continue down this road and if they continue to move uh, legislation through our courts that are taking our guns away from us or infringing that right, uh, we'll be no different than Turkey, uh, which, by the way, in 1911, they established gun control. Uh, and so from 1915 to 1917, 1 1.5 million Armenians yes. were unable to defend, defend themselves, themselves against the tyrannical government. Soviet Union, 1929. Armenian uh, Holocaust. That's exactly, and people don't talk about yeah. the Armenian Holocaust, but that started largely from a 1911 gun, gun control, control legislation. Right. Well, wait, to get back to the, the whole thing of, of guns and having one in your house, do we have the right even up to lethal force? When you look at the, the, the Ten Commandments and it says, do not kill, thou shalt not kill. How do you, how do you interpret that? Uh, well, it's not, thou shalt not kill is the wording there in the understanding. Even Hebrews would tell you that's thou shalt not murder. murder. It's, not, it's not an offensive, premeditated attempt to take someone's life or shed innocent mm -hmm. blood. And so, again, proving the case of a, a defensive use of a weapon, mm -hmm. not an offensive use, but a defensive use outside of war, because there's times you have to be offensive right. in wartime. But outside of that per parameter, uh, uh, the biblical use of what the Bible would call a sword is permittable in a defensive right. situation. Well, and, and, it, and it is murder. I, I hear it misquoted a lot as thou shalt not kill. But later on in those same scriptures, it says, if a man sheds man's blood, by men his, his blood should be shed. The, mm -hmm. the things like capital punishment are, are right there. The, Correct. It's not a killing. It's, it's, it's the, the mandate is against murder. Right, right. And so I, I just think the churches, if, uh, if the people of God uh, could, uh, could not, uh, not, be, uh, not be taught and steered by the culture, go back to the Bible, look at the biblical right, and there's several principles you can look at uh, from, from Genesis chapter 13 all the way through, and you can see how God feels about uh, people carrying weapons 
for the purpose of defense. He knows we live in a fallen world. Yes. And he knows there's evil out there, and, then, and the evil doers are going to take advantage if, if uh, strong men don't stand up. Correct. Strong men and women, in Correct. this case, don't, don't stand up. That's right. That's right. And I think the sin curse <laughs> world, uh, the culture, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that perilous times shall come. That means it's going to get worse. And when the end is mm -hmm. closer, the, 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 the society continues to deteriorate. And, and as we get into those days, they're dangerous days, they're perilous times. And so during those perilous times, we ought to be people that would take the armor of God, God's word, and spiritually engage in the spiritual enemy, but have a, a physical uh, weapon that would help you guard against physical enemies that would attack your home and family. If you found this program for the first time, you may have been surprised to hear viewpoints like these. Well, we want to continue to produce programs on these relevant topics, but to do so, we need your financial support of people like you. Your financial gift to help us continue Viewpoint is greatly appreciated.